Welcome to our first episode of As We Go in Politics from Nufa Radio. I'm Deidre Newby with Felicia Crawford. In today's episode, we will discuss a very sensitive topic for some folks out there, the 2020 election. But before we discuss this week's topic, we need to state our corporate disclaimer, which will appear for a few minutes on your screen. If you would like to read the disclaimer in its entirety, please pause your video and then resume the video once you finish reading it. With that out of the way, our goal in this week's episode is not to closely evaluate each candidate that is running for the presidential office. Instead, we want to help God's people, particularly young voters, to understand the candidate's stance on different issues and how their position corresponds with what the Bible teaches. We are not going to be able to cover every political issue that is endorsed by the candidates, but we will closely look at three hot topics, climate control, abortion, and homosexuality. So before we get started, Felicia, welcome to our new broadcast show, As We Go In Politics. Thank you. It is good to be here. And before we get into our main discussion, Felicia, let's start off with two basic questions. What is Newford and what is your role in Newford? Newford is the parent company of conglomerates of different subsidiaries of companies. So it is like the umbrella or parent company um, that guides and leads and influences the operations of Newford Apparel. Then you have New for Music. Then you have New for Publishing. New for Radio, which we are um, utilizing today. New for Films. New for Animation. And it's not limited to those. And also, New for is a parent company that oversees our different ministry outlets. Felicia Crawford Ministry, D'Adrian Newby Ministry, and so forth and so on. So, New for is the parent company that is the leading and governing body of all the subsidiaries within it. So it is, as you say, a conglomerate. I am the CEO. And I know it says chief executive offer, but officer, but I'm also a steward over that which God has entrusted in my care. So being a steward, I'm managing over that which I consider belongs to God. Since I know it belongs to God, I govern and I rule according to the standards of God. Okay. How does Newford Radio fits in with Newford's overall mission? Well, Newford's overall operational ministry is for us to produce products and service that edify, uplift, and encourage individuals by directing them to the source of abundant living. So we use the platform of Newford Radio to bring forth the word of truth in every aspect of life and using this element of broadcasting to be able to communicate the will, purpose, and plans, and hearts of God concerning his people and concerning circumstances that we're facing today, according to his word, we bring the word of God to life through radio and also the other mediums in which God has entrusted us to use. Okay. Now that we got those two basic questions out of the way, let's get into our discussion, the 2020 presidential election and the Bible. So here's the first question, Felicia. Do you believe Christian leaders should play a role in politics and should Christians participate in elections? Before you answer that, I want to share a comment made by Israel Ramos, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, who is a regular guest on the TV show called Inverse. This brother made the following statement concerning politics and religion, and I quote in part, Religion is the most dangerous when it is combined with politics. Politics and religion are never to be mixed, in a quote. So, Felicia, do you agree with Israel's view concerning politics and religion? Is his perspective accurate based on the scriptures? First and foremost, I'm not here to give my opinion. I'm not here to voice an agenda that is outside God and his kingdom. So to accurately assess Israel Raymond's statement to be incorrect or correct, we must delve into the word of God. So he said religion is most dangerous when it is combined with politics. So when I search my Bible and I see where God 
never intended to be separate from the politics of any country, especially his people. He was king. He brought Israel into being on a theocracy, meaning God was the head and the ruler of all things. If you look at how he managed the judges and even the prophets, when Samuel was the prophet and the last judge, meaning God combined religion with politics. He was the one who judged. He was the one that made sure the governance of the country was ruled by the standards of God. So when the people asked Samuel for a king, Samuel was displeased. First Samuel 8, 6 tells us with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Any leader will always go to God. So God is never separate from the politics of the land. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. They don't want me to rule and govern them any longer. So religion can be most dangerous when you have a religious leader who is corrupt and who is not living according to the standard and upholding the laws, decrees, standards, statutes, precepts of God, not just in the pulpit, but in their lives. It can be most dangerous when you have religious leaders who go into politics only to fulfill or push their own agenda. Then it is most dangerous. But when you have a political figure who is also a religious leader who is living according to the standards, the will and purpose and plans of God for their lives because God never intended to be separate from the governance of the land, then it is not dangerous. It is most beneficial for a nation, for a people, for a kingdom. And so we see this throughout the Bible when it tells us of the plight of Israel. You see, when they were governed by wicked kings, we saw the consequences of that. And when they were governed by good kings, good kings who followed the laws, standards, statutes, precepts, and commandments of God, who sought God, we saw the fruit of that was good. So you can't say that it's most dangerous. In one aspect, it can be when you have leaders that are aligned with God's will. But when you have leaders, religious leaders, who are upholding the word of God and not twisting it to benefit their own sensual appetites, then it is most beneficial to the nation and its people. Okay, so let's go back and focus on that last question I asked that you didn't quite address directly in your response. Should Christians play a role in politics and participate in elections? When you answer those two questions, uh, please consider including 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 in your response. Bringing up 2 Corinthians 5, 20, it says that we are ambassadors of Christ. If you understand the ambassador's role, an ambassador is the authorized messenger and representative of its sovereign, its kingdom. That being said, an ambassador upholds or pushes the goal of it, of his or her king or kingdom. So in order for an ambassador to be effective, he or she must be. An ambassador is a political position. So God is calling us to ambassadorship, not for us to just sit at home or sit in our church world or churchdom and operate in a church, but to go outside of the four walls of the church. He said, go into all the world to go out and make influences in all the spheres of societies. But we are as Christian has been conditioned to believe that we're not supposed to uh, participate in certain secular activities. Well, tell that to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Tell that to Joseph. Please tell that to Joseph. When God positioned these people in secular rams in order to be a help for his people. And so we have close that that door so to speak by being flooded with the notion that we as christians can be involved in polit politics because it's a world system well the bible says the earth is the lord's the fullness thereof the world and all who dwell in it he sent us as light in darkness and if the world system is a dark 
place that he sends light in it to illuminate and show the error of the ways of a system. But if you are so close to the fact that God wants to send his people into the political realm, into the entertainment, into Hollywood, into fashion, into all these realms that the church for so long deemed as evil, then you are missing the prime purpose for which he saved us. He saved us for souls. He came for souls. All souls are mine, says the Lord, but the soul who sins will die. And if we have the truth, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, by, far be it for us not to go into these realms where there are lost souls to try to pull them out of darkness into God's marvelous light. That's some great points you shared. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about when you were saying, tell it to, and then you were named the person. I was like, yeah, tell it to Moses, because in the scriptures, God sent Moses to confront the political leader who was not living righteous and preventing God's people from engaging in certain activities that God required. So can you give us some insight concerning confronting political leaders? Because we have not talked about confronting those who are in political office that are corrupted. Well, if you look at Moses and you look at Daniel, they were both on the pagan systems. And even though Moses was brought up in Pharaoh's house, he left Pharaoh's house, but God sent him back to Pharaoh. He sent him back for, to Pharaoh for his people who were under bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. So God sent Moses and Aaron to confront the, the the fact that God was telling Pharaoh what you what you're doing to his people was not right in God's eyes and God was coming to rectify recompense the evil and the wickedness that were transpiring with his people regard in regards to his people so if we look at Moses and how God operated with this figure with Moses and his brother Aaron, we see that God wasn't running away from the political arena. Mm -hmm. He was sending people in and we can look at Jesus, even the political mm -hmm. aspect of the church. When he was dealing with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law, Jesus never ran from it. He confronted it. And so we have this notion that we're not supposed to confront the evils in the world because this is not our home, but we are ambassadors of Christ and the kingdom of heaven. And we're sent to uphold and to push the agenda of heaven, the goal of heaven. But well, how can we push the agenda and goal of heaven when we want to stay away from the, the spheres of influences in this world? It will not be. And so we get what we got currently. You know, I was not going to touch this, but I got to because when you said we get what we got currently, I feel I would be doing this broadcast a disservice if I do not add this point. We agree we were not going to discuss the candidate specifically, but I got to say this because I keep repeating this to our team when we are discussing politics. As far as Donald Trump, we know the reputation of that man. I'm only aware of one Christian leader who actually called Trump a Christian. I don't agree with that because what my Bible says is you will know them by their fruit. I'm sorry, Donald Trump lacks significantly the characteristics that are required to be called a true Christian. Maybe by man's standard, you can call Trump a Christian, but not by the standards of God's word. The Bible makes it clear that God in different periods in mankind history uses heathens to serve a particular purpose. Believe it or not, God is using Trump for a specific purpose, which I've been saying for a long time now is twofold. I even have written a uh, prophetic word and on our Facebook blog page in regards to Donald Trump. I mean, it may be more than one word in regards to God gave me concerning this man. But one aspect of the way God is using Trump is a wall of protection to delay what is coming around the corner that would greatly impact 
all of mankind, especially Christians, because the church have failed to get their act together and align themselves with what God is doing. God is using Trump to buy the church more time to get their acts together. Two, Trump is also a warning to the church. If we don't get our act together, God will remove his hedge of protection and then allow something worse than Trump character to come along and swallow us up. But enough of that. All right. uh, A hot topic for many of our young voters is climate control. So much so that many of them are supporting such nonprofits like um, the Sunrise Movement. Now, the Sunrise Movement is is fighting for political changes that will address climate issues at a scale that scientists say is necessary. They feel this can be best accomplished through the Green New Deal. That's why we hear a lot of the Green New Deal in the news um, previously when all the different candidates were running. Um, This plan, the Green New Deal, is supposed to take our society towards 100 percent clean and renewable energy, which in turn we are supposed to guarantee a good job for all members of our society and create economic prosperity for all. Sounds great, right? Who wouldn't want that? But for those who are advocating for such things, there is a disconnect in the people's knowledge and understanding of the root behind these climate issues we are observing. So let's expound on that a little bit, Felicia, so that our listeners can gain a better understanding of why we are seeing these tremendous changes in our weather patterns. Like the other day, I just went out to work out and I was in T-shirt. And then today I had to put on a coat and hat. So we want to find out why we are seeing these tremendous changes in our weather patterns and what is the main source or root behind these climate issues we are witnessing. How can you help the listeners have a better understanding of what is actually going on? To explain why these things are occurring as far as climate issues and earthquake and tornadoes and hurricanes and so forth, We have to realize the cause, the beginnings of all the grumbling and the moaning and groaning of creation. Because if you remember the Eden incident, there was something that transpired when God confronted Adam regarding his sin and he cursed the ground. And in Romans 8, 20, it says, and this is the New Living Translation, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope. And it goes on, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So understanding that this world is on the curse because when Adam sinned, it brought in sin and death and sin's curse. So it affects the whole world. It affects everything and everyone in the world. So we can't negate that fact, that truth, and push it aside and try to blame it on all these other things. Maybe they have some contribution to it, but the fact is that everything has been placed in this world The environment has been placed under God's curse. And because sin is running rampant, what you think is going to happen? Curse will run rampant. And then you will start to see the effect of that curse. But no one wants to acknowledge. No one wants to accept. It's better to blame something else rather than sin because no one wants to consider themselves a sinner. Everybody wants to think themselves good people. I'm a good person. That aspect for climate change and the root cause of it, the root is sin and the curse of sin. And also God used the weather to bring about judgment. If you read Hosea chapter four, one through three, it says, and I'm reading the new American standard Bible. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and everyone who lives in it languishes, all the, along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and also the fish of the sea disappeared. 
Yet let no one find fault and let none offer reproof. For your people are like those who contend with the priest. So understanding this, because the land mourns and go through all these trials and tribulations and changes is because of the sin in the land. Point blank, in a discussion, the word of God. Okay, I, I get it. And most Bible students will get what you are saying. But I can only imagine there will be some skeptics or unbelievers who will say, well, that's the Old Testament. Now, when we encounter individuals who make this kind of statement, basically that's their way of discrediting your point by saying you are referring or using only the Old Testament, which they feel is no longer valid, prevalent, or relevant today. So how do you respond to such perspective, Felicia? Um, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. And this is what is labeled in our Bible as New Testament. But there is no old and no new regarding God and his scriptures. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. It was Jesus who quoted scripture in the wilderness. It was the apostles who through the scriptures especially Paul, realized who the Messiah was. It was the, what we call the old scripture is what the first century church relied upon. And the New Testament is a testament of Jesus and the fulfillment of what was in the prophets and in the laws. Even Jesus said, I didn't come and do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. So for those who want to disregard the Old Testament, then you're disregarding scripture as a whole. God's scripture is the same and it is true today as it was yesterday. For the word of God says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall remain. All right, so let's switch gears by turning our attention to abortion. Felicia, let's start by being transparent. What is your position on abortion? My position is instance is according to the word of God. God says every soul belongs to him. The word of God said children are a gift from God. Today, man tries to define when life is, when a fetus is viable. Is it three months? Is it four months? And even now in New York, they want to pass laws that even after the baby is born, you still have the right to abort. That's murder. You need to go to jail. Life is when God told Jeremiah, before you was formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. David said, you knit me in the, in the secret place before my form was fully developed. So understanding that every soul has a purpose. So my stance is I don't agree with it. I don't support it. And I don't believe my tax dollars should support it either. All right. Homosexuality. This is a topic that you and I both can speak with much boldness, confidence, and authority because we both have had past experience in this area. While this might be a sensitive topic for many in the church, it is not for us. It is something you and I both feel we have been called to as part of our ministry. It's no need to beat around the bush with this topic because people are going to believe what they want to believe. So let's just jump right into what the scripture says about this lifestyle. So Felicia, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Well, uh, we should always go to the beginnings and see what God says about a male and male relationship and a female female relationship. In the beginning, God created male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And if we go on to, I know a lot of people don't want 
to quote from Leviticus because they say that a lot of things in Leviticus don't apply to us today, but there is always spiritual application in the word of God because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus said these words, I speak are spirit and their life. The word of God always have spiritual application for our lives. But Leviticus 21, 13 says, if there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. So Leviticus is letting you know God's mind towards the act of male on male sex or female and female sex. He said it's detestable to him because that is not what God made sex for. That is not how God envisioned or intended relationship to be. How can a man and man multiply and be fruitful? How can a woman and woman multiply and be fruitful? It is impossible. So for us to believe because we're living in 2020 that this is irrelevant and the laws of the land stand regardless of what the law says. President Obama can assign into place that you can sleep with a donkey is still wrong in God's eye because God's word is what we will be judged by, not the laws of the United States, not the constitution of the United States, but the laws, decrees, standards, statutes, precepts, and commandments of Yahweh Elohim. So in Romans chapter one, verses 24 through 27, this is a new Testament text, by the way, Romans chapter one, verses 24 through 27. It says, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies will be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served a creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. I mean, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. The word of God. First Corinthians 6 Jesus, I thank you. First Corinthians six, nine and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous would not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And it goes on to say in verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So sometimes a church folk forget what God brought us from. May I never forget where I came from. Because when you forget and think you better than, you can't show compassion for the people who are where you once were. Such were some of you, but you were washed. I was that, but God didn't lead me that way because that way was not acceptable or pleasing to God. Therefore he washed me and he sanctified me. And I continue to go through the sanctification process day by day by day. So let us not think that we are above the law of God. Spiritual ramifications are at play. Oh my God, my God. You got to understand that regardless of what the natural, they say in the natural, the spiritual always rule because we got to stand before a spirit God. God is a spirit and we must govern and live according to the ways, the rules, the standards, the statutes and precepts command and commandments of God always. 
and forever. Um, I can take you to Revelations 22, 15 also, if that wasn't enough. And if, if there'll be some comeback for this and for that, and I understand context is very relevant. I understand it. So you got to understand too, as you looking up the Greek and the Aramaic and the Hebrew, God means what he means. And you can't twist and distort what God says. And if you try to come to a spiritual word in the natural, you will never ever get the true intent or heart of the word. God is spirit. Therefore you must come being spirit fed, spirit led and spirit governed and taught to be able to understand the spiritual ramifications and applications of the word of God. Revelation 22, 15. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lies. Outside, outside of the kingdom, you got to understand that if you are immoral, and you're a sorcerer and you're an idolater and you're practicing all these things that God says are displeasing and unacceptable to him. It's regardless of if we deem it acceptable, <laughs> God doesn't care about what you accept. It's what's acceptable to him. And when, the minute we stop trying to approve of things that God disproves of, you will be all right. But we try to approve of that which God disprove of because of the culture and the custom and the climate we're living in. But God said, be ye separate, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. You're always to uphold the standards of God. I don't care what the laws of the land say. If they oppose the laws of God, we are always to uphold the laws of God as his people. If you're truly sons and daughters of God, you have no problem with this message It's those who call themselves sons, but are really not sons that will have a problem with this message. All right. So Felicia, you have helped us to clearly understand the position God takes on such issue as climate control, abortion, homosexuality. Uh, we wanted to cover gun rights as well, but time would not allow us to do that in this episode. But your biblical explanation in this progress should help all voters to comprehend God's position, regardless if you agree with God's word or not. Um, this is not about our personal view or preferences, but the standards of God when it comes to voting for candidates. Uh, and I think that's the mistake that far too many Christians make when they're trying to decide on the candidates. All you have to really do is go to these individuals website, find the section that they believe in, and then compare it to your scriptures. Is the candidates view in harmony with what the scriptures says? For example, since we're down to two candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, we went to Joe Biden's website and there's a section that says Joe Biden believes. We looked up the three areas that we discussed in this broadcast concerning climate control, abortion, and uh, homosexuality. Let's start with climate control. There's a video on his webpage, which will provide a, the address link that you can go to and listen to. One of the things that uh, Joe Biden emphasized is that he believed that advanced technology is the solution to these climate control issues that we're seeing. It is clear based on the way his his well put together video, he has no understanding of the Bible uh, implication behind why we're seeing the craziness that we see in our weather patterns. And Felicia explained that very well in this podcast. So he lacks understanding in this area. But this is the point I want you to be mindful of um, if you take the time to go and listen to this video. One of the pictures that shows up in his video is Flint, Michigan. And we all are familiar with the water crisis that Flint, Michigan is still experiencing to this very day. Their water crisis begun, I believe, back in April of uh, 2014. And this issue that's taking place in this city, which is still a problem for them today, they, can't, they don't have drinkable water, took place during Joe Biden's when he was in office as our 47th 
vice president. Joe Biden was vice president of this country between 2009 to 2017. And the uh, Flint, Michigan water crisis took place in April of 2014. If technology, advanced technology is the solution to environmental issues and the craziness that we see in our weather patterns, then why didn't they took advantage of all these advanced technologies to solve the problem with Flint, uh, Flint, Michigan? Because it's really not about Americans and it's really about not about solving mankind's problems. It isn't. His administration never resolved uh, Flint, Michigan's issue. Instead, his administration passed this problem on to Trump's administration. If climate controls was such an important to Biden and he really believed technology is the way to fix this environmental issue, then why did his administration not through every advanced technologies at this problem to permanently fix the Flint resident water problem? Okay, abortion is a little more tricky to find his stance on abortion because he's danced around it this topic plenty of times. But he does support uh, abortion with limits. And when you read God's word, it makes it clear God doesn't support abortion with limits. He makes it clear how he sees what abortion is in his eyes. And then when you look at it from a scripture standpoint, it is murder, period. Let's take this other one. When you compare the scriptures to what it says about homosexuality and then look at Joe Biden's plan, according to his website, is to advance the LGBT agenda. Now, say what you want, but the Bible standards on same sex relations has not changed. Romans 1, 24 through 32 makes it very clear. Nowhere in the scriptures will you find without twisting God's word to fit your personal agenda when it comes to living a gay or lesbian lifestyle. I'm sorry, it it just is not there. So my recommendation is for Joe Biden to get in his Bible and at least start with Romans chapter one and read that. And and every Christian who's who have an intentions to vote and you still not clear about what God says about homosexuality, read Romans chapter one. And if if you don't feel like you want to read the whole entire chapter, at least read Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 32, and then cast your vote. All right. Here's the fact that we need to keep in mind. If you're calling yourself a Christian and you're participating in the, the election, you have to look at each candidate and what they are standing for. And if their stance is in opposition to what God says is right in his eye, then should we be voting for that candidate? Joe stance on these three topics that we discussed this evening um, is against Bible standards. You go and you look at the stance on uh, Donald Trump on the same area. He does not support abortion. He uh, he believes in uh, marriages between a man and a woman. He's pro-life, so he doesn't support abortion. As far as climate control, okay, (laughs) you might got something on Donald Trump as far as climate control. But again, this is not a Christian man who really understands the scriptures. If he understood the scriptures, then he would have a better understanding of climate control. But it is what it is. So, at any rate, we hope that this podcast was very helpful for you all this evening. Until the next time, this is Deidre Newby with Felicia Crawford. Thank you for listening to As We Go In Politics on Newford Radio.